from the point of view of the music industry, like BLM, everyone supported. Like if you remember Black Square Tuesday, like you had to put out a black square. That was they they erected a picket line that if you didn't, you couldn't not if you didn't post a black square, you were against it. And th- th- look up what ha- happened to the band Hanson. They posted a, a, a black square like a day late or something. I can't remember exact details. And they got you know, in all sorts of trouble for it. It was it, the, the hysteria at that time. Wait, was, did Mumford and Sons post anything? Do you remember? I I think, um, yeah, I think we did. Right. Um, and I wouldn't have necessarily, I was pretty affected by the George Floyd thing, to be honest, and, and pretty emotional about it. Um, I, I, I would say I had a slightly more nuanced take that I, I, I didn't support Black Lives Matter, the organization. Right. I'd read all the literature, Patrice Khan right. Colors. Before that, I was living in New York. Everyone was talking about BLM and these kind of things. So I, I was brushed up. I knew that they were a Marxist organization. I knew that um, it was anti-family. Uh, I, I, if I didn't know, I was soon to know that they were anti-Israel. And, you know... Um, I, pr- I I knew that they were extreme. Yeah. And then look what ha- look what they did with the money. Yeah. <laughs> um but you couldn't you couldn't I didn't appreciate that this topic it was a slightly different story in England. I didn't quite appreciate how divisive the issues here in America. And but <laughs> oh, by the end of two days it was a segment on Tucker and the View and I was like what the hell but the the more significantly it was like in my personal life and in my business life all the phone calls start happening and it's like that was a horrible time that I, I don't particularly like to uh, <laughs> to relive. Did you at least, despite that incredible turmoil, was there an outpouring of support? Did you feel at least some level of embrace then? I was very surprised by that. I think that letter got read over a million times. Oh it, goes, it got read. Yeah. Th- that medium piece, I think, was like 600,000 or 650. But then it got got reshared on other other media mm-hmm. outlets, like the Daily Mail, I think the New York Post or something. They... they put it out my feeling at the time the the period before that so again just not the whole story has been said here but initially after the tweet i apologized to try and kill it because it was like kicking a hornet's nest they they came all these activists came after not just me they came after my whole band and their families and things like threatening you know to hurt us hurt them uh things like uh, going on uh, someone went onto my wikipedia page that night and changed it from Wiki- uh, winston marshall is a banjo player to winston marshall is a fascist <laughs> and my i had a friend like helping me out changing it back but they she was up all night because they kept changing it back and i think it changed like six times they, they do everything they can to destroy your reputation um and so i i wanted to kill all of that and I was like, maybe I don't know everything about this topic. Like, I just read one book. Like, maybe I... Well, I mean, I, mean, I knew quite a lot about the topic. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. But I was still open yeah, yeah. to, you know, thine ignorance of thine ignorance is thy fear as foe. You can... I, I was I accepted happily that I might not know the whole story. So then I looked into it. I issued this apology. Uh, uh, I spent a few months really getting into it. Like, uh, looking into the topic what my what were my blind spots what have i i made made wrong and eventually i mean again i've said this story so many times so your listeners can find it elsewhere but eventually uh, decided to publish the letter as you described and basically retracted my apology but the only way i could do that for various reasons i had to quit the band as well so it and then it it got it, as you say it kind of had a, a viral moment now but but at that point by the time i published the letter I just needed to clear my conscience. I wasn't sleeping. I wasn't eating. I was like, I've been part of the lie. Like this letter, this uh, apologizing when I'd done nothing wrong. I was like, what if I had kids? Like I'd be like such an embarrassing dad. Huh. I like basically a cuck that I had to do this letter. It's just, it was hum- utterly humiliating for me. So the the point for me, and, and there was other aspects too. Like I'm a musician. Our job is the pursuit of truth. So if I have this letter, like whatever I put out now is, it's like, it, it's degraded by the that letter. It 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 lo- loses impact because I'm not. An, there's an amazing Solzhenitsyn piece called "Live Not by Lies" that he published in 1974. Um, I think on the eve of his expulsion from Moscow, and I I'd read that maybe five times. It kept hitting me, and it, it's um you should you should read it. 
and there's one particular paragraph that's saying, if you call yourself, how dare you call yourself an artist if you're not prepared to live by the truth or pursue the truth? I can't remember the exact words. And that kept hitting me. And so for me, when we pu- for when I published, it was about getting my dignity and my soul back. And I, and I did. So my initial response was like, <sighs> like my conscience is clean. So I was like, I kind of could relax then after three months of like, in a turmoil, in a turmoil, yeah. So, um, yeah, that's a very long story. Sure. Were would you were you sure. <laughs> were you expelled from the music industry, or did a lot of people keep ties with you after that? A weird thing happened. There, there's certainly a few people in the industry that I stayed friends with, and funnily enough, so um, it's it's a it's a mixed one. A lot of people will privately, including major pop stars, will privately talk to me. Say I agree with you. I actually read that book. Did you get mad though that they weren't speaking out in your defense? At some point, I would have been like, "Come on, can we have someone step up?" Uh, It's like I know what it's like. If they could lose a lot, and I understand how big a sacrifice that is, and why should they throw it away over something they don't necessarily know? Um, it's true that it all of these things need a critical mass. Like if yeah. a lot of people have been like, what the fuck is this ridiculous story? Yeah. I had actually said something. Yeah, it would have been uh, thrown away. It goes back to what we were saying earlier about um, people self-centering because if you speak out, you know, they're scared of yeah. the tar. Yeah. Um, sorry, what was the question? Sorry, I interrupted that. Uh, yeah. Well, I mean, I, I think, you know, Solzhenitsyn, Solzhenitsyn, your parallel would be being exiled from... The music industry. Oh well, so yeah, I speak to people in the music industry still, and but funnily enough, since I've been outspoken against anti-Semitism and outspoken on Israel, actually, a lot of my friends who are Jews in the industry will speak to me saying, "Thank you for writing this article. Thank you for d- doing this interview," because they cannot speak because there's a. <laughs> I, I this is a theory, right? I don't actually know this is true, but this my theory is that. There's uh, the the industry, you might think it's controlled by the elders who are the CEOs or whatever, but actually it, the, the people who generate the money are artists aged between 15 and 25. Like that's where the big stars are. Huh. And so if you, and again, this is just the theory, but if those people are so like adamant about not working people with the wrong opinions, they might literally not work with a manager or not work at a label if they see they don't want to be associated with another person who's on there. So associating with me, although the adults, some of the adults are very happy to still see me privately, but I suspect that it's not necessarily in their professional interests to to work with me. Having said that, some of them said they would, and um, it's, it's not entirely... I, you know, I, I have I put my, I did a US solo tour. I put out a Christmas single. So I'm still making music and I, I'm sitting on, I'm nearly finished the record. So I, I still Ooh, make music. It's just, yeah. um, uh, it, but it is the case that, um, that in the music industry, there's, that in the artist section, I'm kind of a tricky one. To <laughs> <laughs> there's an asterisk. <laughs> But, it, but it's not, I, I'm certainly never going to claim I'm like completely ostracized. It's more complicated than that. It's, um, and, and I can put out music and there's artists, look at someone like Ariel Pink who went to the Trump, uh, the, the Jan 6 Trump yeah. rally. Not, he didn't go to the Capitol Hill yeah. storming, but he went to the preceding rally and he got com- dropped from his record label and, and he'd be a good guy for you to bring on yeah. the show. He's a, he's a fun one. <laughs> and, um, you know, and he's still putting out music and you could still put out music independently and right. you don't need a label anymore. Look what happened to Oliver Anthony. Right. Um, blew up without really much yeah. support. Just, you just right. need to, great songs and some, uh, you know, some heart. So before we go back to dissident dialogues and some of the larger cultural issues, just on your story, one thing that we talked about is the lack of courage around you, and I, I respect what you said, where you're kind of like, if one of these big names were to speak up on your behalf, they'd be falling on their sword, potentially risking their career, uh, a lot of people's success and reputations around them, this sort of gravy train they're on, bringing it to a crashing halt. So I get, it's a lot to sacrifice. The band, Mumford & Sons. There was, I think in 2022, Marcus Mumford said they begged you to stay. Did you feel like you had that support? 
Uh, no one begged me to say. 